Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning. Today's sermon, Does Baptism Matter?, was inspired by the liturgical questions I've received from many of you over the past year, especially in our Route 66 Bible study class, especially those of you who are coming to the United Church of Christ from different faith traditions, uh, those of you who have had no faith tradition before reaching our church, you often have questions like, does baptism matter? But Many of you, whether it's in class, whether it's after worship, whether it's at the Wednesday largest table meal, you are asking astute and probing questions about our faith. And most importantly, why does any particular faith practice matter to us so much today, thousands of years after events happen? If you are newer to us, we're going to do a little bit of teaching today and hopefully um, share some modern metaphors that um, will help you understand why baptism matters. If you are newer to us, I'm going to do a little bit of teaching. We have a new member class after worship today, and, and uh, some of this material will be included. You may not know that in the United Church of Christ, we celebrate two sacraments. So our longtime members, can you tell me what those two sacraments are? Not Hank, because he's in seminary. What are those two sacraments we celebrate in the United Church of Christ? Communion and baptism. Communion and baptism. Now, that's uh, opposed to say, or in contrast to, seven sacraments in the Catholic tradition. For example, if you were raised Catholic, confirmation is a sacrament. And we don't use that same terminology. And there's a lot of theology, and I could really get into a lot of wonderful church history at this point, but I won't, because uh, not everyone is interested in um, thousands of years of church history and why we are where we are today. The question that many of you have expressed is, I understand that a lot of church history got us to this point, but why does baptism matter? 
matter. I mean, many of you, if you've been coming for a while, you've been able to experience communion here, which we do once a month, first Sundays of the month. We uh, do communion every Wednesday at the largest table community meal. But some of you may not yet have had a chance to witness or experience a baptism here. And you may not know that a person must be baptized before becoming a member of this church, and especially becoming, before becoming a leader in the church, like Dave Sarver and Brian Martini, who are going to be new leaders on our church board, and they will be actually installed by the congregation um, a little bit later in the service. There's a particular litany that the congregation uses to um, continue to authorize their call to leadership in this way. But it's not just questions about baptism and why does it matter from people who are coming new to our church, but many of us veterans of the faith often forget what it means to be baptized, especially when we're confronted with feelings of scarcity and lack and discomfort, loss, fear, and doubt. You know, we forget what it means to be a baptized Christian sometimes. It happens to all of us. We forget what it means to be baptized. When we leave this wonderful sanctuary after a wonderful hour, hour and 15 minutes of, of great worship, and then we try to live good lives the rest of the week out there in the real world, a world that is filled with hate and greed and polarization and so many other challenges today. So on this particular Sunday each year, the Baptism of the Lord Sunday, we honor Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and we wrestle with what it means for us today as we seek to remember our baptism once again. This is a tradition, and I, I want to share some history with you today, but this is a tradition that has been unbroken since the New Testament times. That's really significant. Christians, since the New Testament, have practiced and remembered their baptisms. And it's really interesting because the Bible actually gives us very little in the scriptures in the way of instructions, specific instructions for baptism. So it's remarkable that given that there was some latitude, there weren't a lot of very specific instructions other than some key elements about how you do baptism, it is really remarkable that Catholics and Protestants and different denominations and even different local churches have so many ways to express baptism, and yet they all have one thing in common. Baptisms all have one thing in common. Do you know what it is? It's back in the back. It's water. All baptisms have one thing in common, and that's water. So let me just say we shared a funny yesterday about the waters of baptism because there are different practices. And this one says, hey, man, you could have at least just poured some water over my head without trying to drown me. And um, the man doing the baptizing says, sorry, man, but I'm John the Baptist. You must have been looking for John the Episcopalian. Um, because there are different practices in the faith. You know, there was a pastor in Winston-Salem, Winston North Carolina, who was teaching a membership class like we're going to be teaching after church today. And he was explaining how some churches baptized by full immersion, that's uh, uh, in the baptistry where you go fully underwater. Um, I've done many of those in our duly affiliated American Baptist United Church of Christ churches where there's a baptistry that's back behind um, the altar typically, or sometimes they'll have kind of pop-up baptistries. I always thought those are cool. They're like little mini pools. And um, people are fully immersed. So some churches baptized by full immersion in water, and other churches baptized with like just a little sprinkling, hold your bangs up, don't get your hair wet, in other traditions. Now, this pastor was teaching all of the elements of the differences in baptismal practice, and the class seemed knowledgeable as he went through all of the different denominations. So the pastor asked the class, does anyone know how the Quakers are baptized? And a young man answered, Oats. Okay, there's your. So you have two things. You can share that on Facebook and you can share how are Quakers baptized. Okay. 
But thankfully, all Christians use water, not oats, as we celebrate today the spiritual washing away of all that gets in the way of being who God created us to be. Now, there is one more big difference um, in traditions about baptism, um, and it's infant versus adult baptisms. So, um, water we hold in common, but when people are baptized, sometimes can be different. So, um, how many of you were baptized as an infant in your tradition? Wow, most of you. How many of you were baptized as an adult? Oh, oh, good number there too. All right. All right. Well, sometimes our kids ask us, like, how come some got to be baptized as a baby and how come some got to be baptized as an adult? And they often ask this when they see kind of their family photos where they might be like in a white christening dress. You remember those right white christening dresses or outfits. Um, and that's despite the fact you may not know that in the Protestant tradition, we don't christen at all. To christen means to name, which most parents have already done for their child by the time they reach the point of the baptism. We baptize. Now, we might do a baby dedication and then an adult baptism, but I'll get to that in a moment. It's not that we don't recognize the baby growing up in the faith tradition, but we don't christen, we baptize, because baptism is a crucial concept of our faith, whether, again, through that, that process of infant baptism and then later confirmation, or through baby dedication and believer's baptism. And here at St. John's, we honor both practices. So again, there's a lot more to say about that, but no matter at what age or under what circumstances you were baptized, it matters, because baptism is more than a religious rite. It is a passage to a new life. You know, we forget that baptism is not the end of a spiritual decision-making journey. It is the beginning of one. Baptism is the start, not the end, of a lifetime of Christian faith. So, Sometimes I have to agree with my United Church of Christ colleagues who comment on social media and wish that it was harder to qualify for baptism and to join the church. They want to make it harder. And I saw some of the comments and I thought, well, honestly, sometimes I think it's harder to get a membership at Costco than it is to become a Christian through baptism. You've seen all those forms you have to fill out? And that can be a bad thing because it's bad because if the church is easy to join and baptism is willy-nilly for everybody, then any notions of the responsibilities of church membership can fly right out the window. And that's always a tough conversation to have in church because sometimes talking about what it means to be part of this whole Christian enterprise, it can start to sound like a car commercial where the announcer starts talking legalese at 1,000 miles an hour where they say something like, you know, baptism is terrific, but please plan on tithing, attending worship, and experiencing regular frustration and discomfort. Be advised that Christmas and Easter Sunday come only once a year, respectively, so you will still have to attend church every week, even on the boring Sundays with very long sermons and no special music. Right? I mean, who can blame people for tuning some of that part out? So, despite that, I can't help but wish that baptism, kind of signing on that dotted Christian line, were understood to be a much bigger commitment than it is in some churches. So, about a year and a half ago, one of our new church members was getting baptized, and he had a hobby that got me thinking. And I began thinking, what if? What if, instead of just a little chase sprinkling on the forehead while you hold up your bangs, or even a full immersion in the Scioto River, what if the only way to be baptized and to join this church was by skydiving? Right? The very thought of that makes my stomach do backflips, but if you think about it, you have to prepare, you have to take classes, you have to board an airplane, you have to go very high off the ground, and you have to jump at the appointed time. And if you know anything about skydiving, after you jump, you have to have a straight free fall before you get to pull that ripcord and then just kind of float gently to the ground. I mean, what is not theological about that? I mean, when we really talk about the reality of sin and redemption, 
and the dangerous thrill of falling and that great vista of salvation and the recognition that our lives are not really in our own hands, what is that if it's not just like skydiving? And imagine what it would mean to go through that kind of a skydiving spiritual experience with all of its terrors and its rushes and its ultimate relief, and then to show up at church on a Sunday and to be greeted by a room full of people who had been through all of that too. Think how you would see everyone as you walked in and found your pew, as you walked in and saw the older couple sitting in the front holding hands, as you talk to people who love the traditional music and others who don't, as you met the man who circles the typos in the bulletin every Sunday and submits it back to the church office, he calls pretty frequently too, and um, if you met the guy who seems as if he only comes to church because it makes his wife really, really happy, Gary. Um, (laughs) He's up there doing video. But think how you would see people, the heavy and the creaky, the busy, the young and the old, the happy and the sad, those grieving and those dancing, the people that you find pretty much in every church every Sunday. Think about how you would see them all if baptized meant that at some point, however many years before, they had that day. That day when somehow they summoned enough courage to leap out into thin air into the hands of God. Because think about it. All four gospel writers describe the baptism of Jesus as a radical act for all sorts of reasons. I mean, in the Gospel of Mark, for example, I love this description where Mark writes that as Jesus was coming out of the water, Jesus saw the heavens torn apart and then that spirit descending like a dove. But Mark's word for torn apart, it's schizo. Schizo. And it means literally to cleave, to cleave asunder, to rend. And it is a strangely violent word to describe such a happy occasion. I mean, the way we talk about baptism today, it was like the video we saw for the kids. It might have made more sense if the writers had just talked about the dove gently cooing and fluttering above the surface of the water. But that is not how the gospel writers talk about baptism. They talk about the heavens being schizo or torn apart as part of the process. And it's the word that Matthew, Mark, Luke all use. If you think about that word schizo, it's the same word that Matthew, Mark, and Luke use to describe that moment on a Good Friday when the curtain of the temple is torn in two. It's the word that John uses when the Roman soldiers are at the foot of the cross and they're determined not to tear Jesus' garment and divide it between them, but they cast lots for it instead so that one of them can have the whole garment without schizo rending, cleaving it. It's a word which, which resonates in the prophecies of Isaiah. We heard some of Isaiah earlier, but particularly when God says, or Isaiah says to God in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 19, Oh God, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. I mean, the gospel writers understand very clearly that in Jesus, that is exactly what happened. God has torn open the heavens and come down to us. And this is why the baptism of Jesus is so very clearly a radical act. Because in Jesus, God has committed the act, literally, of breaking and entering into the world. So, How much of God's active interest in us today are we really prepared to admit? Because if we took our baptisms seriously, it might just tear our lives apart too, which is not a bad thing. Because when God draws near in our lives and in our church, our world is changed. So let me share a baptismal story with you from Reverend Christopher Henry, a story that struck me immediately as familiar because it resonates with the stories I have heard here the past seven years from our own congregation, stories from years ago that continue to resonate. And Reverend Henry tells the story this way. 
He writes, several years ago, we attended a Sunday afternoon book club in a small town in North Carolina. The participants in the book club were the pastors and lay leaders of local congregations, Episcopalians, Baptists, uh, UCC, Methodists, Catholics, and Presbyterians. And that day, writes Reverend Henry, we found ourselves sharing personal stories of faith formation, which is what's going to happen in the new member class. People are going to share their stories of faith formation, and Pastor Mary has some wonderful techniques using art to help people uh, uh, unearth that and to do that. But Reverend Henry says, that day at the book club, we found ourselves sharing personal stories of faith formation. How did you become a Christian? Where did your faith journey begin? So often we have a hard time talking about that. But one by one, members of the group described how they had been raised by loving and faithful parents who brought them to church every Sunday morning for Sunday school in church and told us the stories of Jesus and helped us to grow in maturity and faith. And Reverend Henry writes that we knew, we knew in that group that we were loved by God. We had known since we were children. We knew we were loved by God and that we were called to serve. So each story sounded something like that until there was only one person left to speak. And this is a true story, and her name is Janet. And as tears formed in her eyes, Janet said, I am a Christian because the Christian church saved my life. And suddenly the chatty book group fell silent. And Janet described how she had been abandoned by her parents as an infant. She was sent to a foster home where she was abused and neglected for the first six years of her life. You can imagine. At age seven, Janet was finally adopted by a local family. And that day as she came home and that night, she did not know what to expect. So she spent that first night wide awake in her new bed, afraid and anxious. And the next morning was a Sunday, and the family got up early, had breakfast, and got into the car. And Janet went with the family, and she said, it was my first time at church, and I had no idea what to expect as a seven-year-old. Janet said, we walked into the Sunday school classroom, the teacher's face lit up, and the teacher said, welcome, Janet, we've been waiting for you. Welcome, Janet, we've been waiting for you. And then the teacher read the Bible story for the day, the one where Jesus said, let the children come unto me, don't stop them. And Janet said, I will never, ever forget that feeling of welcome. She said, I am a Christian because of that moment. Baptism means a new beginning, the kingdom in the midst of the wilderness. Baptism means that God has broken through the problems and challenges of the world, as Janet experienced. And so we too, in turn, by virtue of our baptisms, are called to tear into the challenges and problems of the world with everything that we've been given. Our baptisms are a call to be part of the remarkable and redemptive work of God. You know, when Jesus came up out of the Jordan waters, perhaps that is what he saw. Perhaps he saw a vision of God and a a vision of what it truly means to be God's hands and feet in the world. And that is what your baptism and mine are still pointing to, to be God's hands and feet in the world. So that's why we remember this every single year, and we continue to revisit some of these stories of baptism. Because no matter where you were baptized, whether it's in the front of the same baptismal font where your grandmother and mother were baptized, we have our old baptismal font there behind the screen. It's old, made of stone, came over from Germany. We have legacy members who will tell you how they were baptized in that font. Five generations worth of family. Whether you are baptized with that kind of legacy, whether you were baptized by the banks of a river somewhere, or whether you were baptized standing in the sanctuary of a church like Scott was 18 months ago, where you can hardly believe that you have found a church home. No matter where it is, the water and the promise and the prayer, they literally only take a few moments in time. 
but truly saying yes to our baptism is the daily work of the rest of our lives. It is saying yes to the world and yes to a life torn open by the love of God. Sometimes that means discomfort and pain and challenge and where do we go from here? But our baptisms mean saying yes to a life torn open by the love of God. So, it is probably unlikely that anytime soon we will decide to replace baptism by water and the Spirit with baptism by gravity and parachute. I think that might be fine. Baptism by gravity and parachute. But the next time you walk into the church and encounter God's people in all of our familiar shapes and sizes, remember that what unites us all is something that God's Word tells us is even more electrifying than jumping out of a plane. In baptism, the heavens themselves were torn apart, and when we experience that for ourselves, when we know that for ourselves, when we feel it in our hearts at last, it is the thrill of a lifetime. It is when everything in our lives finally begins. Let us pray. Almighty God, wash over us today as we remember our baptisms and seek to live into your promise of new life. Wash over us anew today until we know in our hearts that we have been blessed by you, God, adopted by you, forgiven by you, baptized by you. Wash over us anew today, God, until we have been made blameless and holy before you in love, until we have been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. God, help us all to live courageously and joyfully, even if it means jumping out into thin air into your loving hands. Because once we are flying free in you, God, we can do anything you ask of us, even change the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we remember our baptisms. We're sitting in a church, in a church community that's almost 150 years old. And one of the reasons our church has been so sustainable over time, this is not our original building. This building is almost 100 years old, but the congregation moved from location to location as it grew and became stronger, and then one day came here. But one of the reasons that we are still bound together after almost 150 years and we continue to grow and learn and change is because of the gifts of people like you and our other supporters who know how important this ministry is. We change lives every single day, not just in worship and baptism and communion, but outside, if you'll see folks sleeping around our building at night, we change lives. We change lives on Wednesdays with almost 200 people now having lunch, a hot lunch every day in our kitchen. We change lives by, by providing space for the open shelter that provides daily services to the homeless and marginally housed. And I share all of this with you because your gifts truly matter. And when we give our tithes and offerings, we are witnesses to the transforming love of God in Christ, whose baptism we celebrate. I invite you to give as generously as you have received. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about the good old way, shall wear a starry.